Hi, I'm Mr. McMillan and welcome to part two of my introduction to the ontological argument. In part one we looked at some background ideas to the argument as well as St. Anselm's classical form. In part two we're going to look at some other forms of the argument as well as the major criticisms of the arguments. A number of other scholars have developed the ontological argument. The French mathematician and philosopher René, I think therefore I am, Descartes, believed the ontological argument was proof of God's existence. As a mathematician he was used to working with deductive arguments, because in effect all mathematical sums are deductive arguments. Firstly, like Anselm he believed it was possible to know God's essence. His argument goes as follows. Premise 1. God is a supremely perfect being, i.e. any characteristic we think God has, for example power or knowledge or goodness, God has it perfectly or completely, which would mean he has all the usual attributes of God, e.g. omniscience, omnipotence and so on. In other words, God has all perfections, he is completely perfect. Premise 2. Existence is itself a perfection. Existence must be one of the predicates of a perfect being. To put it another way, God without existence is as absurd as a triangle without three sides. For Descartes it makes no sense. Therefore, since 1. God has all perfections and 2. Existence is a perfection, we must conclude that God has existence as a perfection and therefore he exists. Norman Malcolm, a 20th century American philosopher, developed Anselm's second argument, focusing on the idea of necessary existence. He said, if God doesn't exist, he can't then come into existence, or he would not be God. So if God doesn't exist, his existence is impossible. Conversely, if God does exist, he can't cease to exist, or he wouldn't be God. In other words, if God exists, his existence is necessary. Malcolm then argues as follows. Premise 1. God's existence is either necessary or it is impossible. Premise 2. God's existence is not impossible since it is not self-contradictory. Therefore, God's existence must be necessary, which means God exists. Alvin Plantinga, another 20th century American philosopher, also supports the ontological argument. He uses a form of what is called modal logic. This uses the idea of possible worlds to assess the validity of certain statements. He argues as follows. Premise 1. There is a possible world with a being with maximal greatness, which means it is a being that has the attribute of existing in all possible worlds. Premise 2. In any possible world, this being has maximal excellence, which means it has attributes like omniscience and omnipotence. Premise 3. Our world is a possible world which means therefore that this maximally great being exists in our world. Therefore God, who is this being, exists. Various criticisms of the ontological argument have been made, and they can be grouped together into approximately three categories, although there is some overlap between these ideas. Firstly, the ontological arguments rely on having an agreed definition of God, but various philosophers have said that we cannot know fully what God's essence is, and even if we did, we could not know for certain that we had got it right. Thomas Aquinas, despite being a theist, felt this was why an a priori argument could never prove God's existence. Instead, we can only establish God's existence by looking for a posteriori evidence. Secondly, some critics have claimed that existence cannot be treated as a real predicate of a subject. To put it another way, we cannot say that existence can be part of the essence of a thing. To understand what this means, you need to know what we mean when we talk of the essence of something. The essence of a thing are those attributes, or predicates as they are called, that are essential to make that thing what it is. For example, the essence of a chair is made of three things. To be a chair, a thing must have one, a part to sit on, two, a part to rest your back, and three, a part that raises it off the ground. Take away any one part and you no longer have a chair. If you are sitting on a chair right now watching this video, I can tell you, without even seeing your chair, that it has a part to sit on, a part to rest your back, and some part that raises it off the ground. I know these truths a priori, without needing to see the evidence for myself. Similarly, the ontological argument claims that since existence is part of the essence of God, we can know without even seeing synthetic evidence that God has existence. But many critics believe this is false. Saying something exists does not add anything to the essence of that thing. 
Saying God exists, or unicorns exist, or triangles exist, doesn't tell us anything new about God, or unicorns, or triangles. So it seems that existence cannot be part of their essence. Immanuel Kant, a German philosopher, argued that the statement God exists can never be treated as an analytic statement. Analytic statements can only describe ideas and not reality. Bertrand Russell said that if existence could be treated as a predicate, the following argument would work. Premise 1, men exist. Premise 2, Santa is a man. Therefore, conclusion, Santa exists. The conclusion of this argument is false. Sorry to break it to you, but Santa's not real. But if existence were a real predicate, it would be true. Therefore, existence cannot be a real predicate. Thirdly, the argument has been criticised for using logical tricks to try to define something into existence. The French monk Gaunilo of Marmoutier, a contemporary of Anselm, said that if Anselm's argument truly worked, it could be used on pretty much anything. If, for example, we said that there is an island which no island could be greater thought of, according to Anselm's logic, then such an island would have to exist. But this is plainly absurd. So Gaunilo believed Anselm's argument was false. Brian Davis claimed that the argument effectively uses circular logic, which could not be trusted. If we look at Norman Malcolm's argument, he moves from saying, if God exists, he exists necessarily, to saying that God exists necessarily, therefore God exists. Let me give a simpler example to see if you can see the flaw that Davis thinks he has spotted. I could argue the following. If I don't fill my car with petrol, it will stop running. My car has stopped running, therefore I must not have filled it with petrol. This is a logical fallacy, since the argument only works one way. The first statement may well be true, but it doesn't necessarily follow that the reverse is also true. There could be plenty of other reasons why my car stopped working. Ultimately, what all of these criticisms share is that they believe it is impossible or illegitimate to move from the idea of God to the reality of God. In fact, the name ontological argument was a name made popular by Immanuel Kant, who was a great critic of the argument. The Greek word ontos means reality, and Kant used this name because he believed the argument made an unacceptable logical leap from ideas to reality. So what to conclude? It has been said that the ontological argument either totally succeeds or it totally fails. The supporters of the ontological argument believe that if we accept their assumptions about the nature of God, then we cannot fail to accept that God must exist. Anselm says that if God doesn't exist, we are left with an inherent contradiction. Therefore, God cannot not exist. While Descartes, Malcolm and Plantinga created their own revisions of the argument, if we find ourselves agreeing with the premises of the ontological arguments, then it becomes difficult, if not impossible, to disagree with their conclusions. On the other hand, the critics of the ontological argument believe it fails. They believe that all the terms that we use to describe what type of argument it is are the very things that mean it doesn't work. Aquinas said no a priori argument can prove God's existence, only one based on experience. Kant said that the statement God exists can only ever be a synthetic statement based on evidence, not an analytic statement. And Gaunilo and Davis argued that although it claims to be a deductive argument, it is invalid as it uses logical tricks to get to its conclusion. So does the argument work? That's for you to decide. My name has been Mr McMillan, thanks for watching. Please make sure to follow me on Twitter and subscribe to my YouTube channel. You can also download an audio-only version of this video from podbean.com.